Well, good morning, Element Church. I am coming to you today, obviously, from a little bit different place, but I want to welcome you into a fireside chat and into our living room. And you get to hang out with me today and my hubby cup. Uh, We're going to drink some coffee. We're going to get into the Word of God, and we're going to talk about prayer today, guys. We're in week three of our series, which is called Self-Propelled Discipleship. And what we've been talking about is this idea that Uh, Jesus invites us to follow him. And the idea of a disciple is one who is learning as an active participant who's following. Uh, And that really in the Christian life, uh, we can have great teaching, we can have great worship, we can have great uh, spiritual community. But really at the end of the day, it comes down to us having a conviction and taking on a uh, a position of maturity and responsibility to say, you know what, I'm responsible for my own discipleship. And Paul talks to us all through the New Testament about how he's, he, he's writing to the New Testament churches. And he says, I wish I could teach uh, you with meat, but uh, you're only drinking milk. You know, I wish you would mature and grow up and be able to eat on your own, but I need to keep feeding you. And so just this idea, guys, that we can take responsibility for our own spiritual journeys. And so we've been talking about that. Uh, we've been looking, the goal of this series is to look at seven practices uh, of of discipleship and maturity. And so uh, in week one, we talked about just this idea of practices, that we need paradigms, uh, spiritual paradigms, but we also need spiritual practices, these kind of tangible, concrete realities. Uh, We talked about practices in week one. And then last week, uh, we had the opportunity to talk about reading the Bible together. And man, we blazed through a lot of content and really talked about reading the Bible. Uh, You can go back and check that out on our phone app if you guys missed that along the way. Today, uh, as I said, want to talk to you guys about the idea of prayer and uh, prayer. And uh, let me get my notes uh, going here. I've got all sorts, as you can imagine, all sorts of like little blips and boxes and all this all over the place here. So, um, uh, so today you guys, uh, prayer week three, self-propelled discipleship. Let me pray for us and let's jump right in today. So father, thank you for this time together. God, we thank you that, uh, through the miracle of technology, even in a moment like this, we can be together and we can learn from your word together. God, thank you for speaking to us and teaching us. And God, I pray for myself, God, that these words would be, uh, just spoken through me, that they wouldn't be my words, they would be your words, God, that I would be a conduit. And God, I pray for your anointing on your word today. Um, God, wherever your word goes, it's anointed. But God, I pray that as it's spoken today, that it would carry that weight and power, God, to break bonds and set people free. God, I thank you for spiritual ears and spiritual eyes and spiritual hearts to be open to receive today. So God, each and every person as we're listening right now, God, we make a confession for each and every one of us. We make a personal confession to say we're open to hearing from you today. God, come and speak to us and change us for an encounter with you is an encounter with life change. An encounter with your word is an encounter with a different kind of life. And so we thank you for that today and we love you in Jesus name. Amen. Awesome, you guys. Well, I uh, want to start out um, this morning, and I want to take you guys to the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. Yeah, that should be on your screen for you there. How do you like that? That's pretty cool, huh? Uh, 1 Kings 19, it says this in verse 11. It says, the Lord said, uh, well, I, I guess I should probably tell you what's going on here first, but um, this is uh, actually a story of Elijah, and I, I won't give the whole backstory. You can go read it in the book of First Kings. But uh, Elijah basically is in a spot in his life where he's actually pretty discouraged, and he doesn't quite know what to do. Um, he uh, he finds himself in a place where he's alone, where he's in a cave, where he's literally kind of isolated, and he's pretty downtrodden, and he, he doesn't quite know what to do. And whenever we're in those kind of places, and I know you've probably been there, and I know I've spent time there as well, um, and even when we're not in those downtrodden places, just in everyday life, wherever we are in our life, uh, this really is the answer and the solution that the Bible gives us for the downtrodden moments and for the everyday moments. Uh, and this is, uh, we pick up the story here as Elijah is in the cave and he's looking for something. And it, it says uh, in verse 11, the Lord said to Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. That's me, right? He, he's saying me, uh, for I'm about to pass by, for the Lord's about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. 
And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And it's really cool because the English Standard Version says a low whisper. The New American Standard Bible says a gentle blowing. And the King James Version, uh, Thou Art, says uh, it is a still small voice. And so just this idea that Elijah is in a moment where he's not quite sure what to do next. Uh, and again, whether that's in a place of desperation like Elijah was or whether that's in an everyday situation when we don't know what to do next. What do we do? Well, it says the Lord passes by, but he doesn't pass by always in a flash and a bang and thunder and storms and earthquakes. And we think about God's voice like that, but he actually comes in a low whisper or a gentle blowing or a still small voice. And uh, what we get is a, uh, and again, um, in the ESV, we get a gentle whisper or a low whisper. And you might ask the question, why does God whisper? Why doesn't God come in an earthquake and in a fire? And sometimes God might do that. But really, uh, I love a book written by a mentor of ours as a church, Pastor Mark Batterson. He wrote a book years ago called Whisper. And he said this, he said, the reason God speaks, his idea of this scripture of why God would speak in a gentle whisper is because the purpose of God speaking with us is not just directive, Uh, The purpose of us speaking with God in prayer is not just to get something or to hear something, but the purpose of prayer and the exchange between mankind and God is actually intimacy. And to, uh, to hear a whisper, you have to be really close to somebody. And so the idea that when we don't know what to do, whether it's in a situation like Elijah was in where we're desperate or whether it's an everyday situation, that when, we talk, when we're talking to God, he, he often whispers to us because he wants us to lean close into him. Because the point of prayer is not to get something. The point of prayer is actually to get closer to God. And that's the point of prayer. And so that's why God whispers to us. And it's really interesting because if you just talk about the physical ear and you talk about decibels, at 110 decibels, we experience a change in our blood pressure. And 141 decibels, we can actually become physically nauseous. And if you go all the way up, uh, at 195 decibels, our eardrums can actually rupture. And at 202, we can actually die by the sound of those decibels coming in through sound waves. But on the far other end of the spectrum, at just 15 decibels, just above the absolute threshold of hearing at 15 decibels is, is a whisper. And that is, again, you have to lean close into that. And if you can imagine something that quiet, you would need to lean in and get close. And that's why God speaks to us sometimes in a whisper. And that's what prayer really is all about, is actually getting close to God, hearing his voice, gaining intimacy with him and learning his way. And I, I wrote this down on my notes. Prayer is not about getting stuff. It's about getting him. And of course, we know that God cares about us and we know that we have needs and God cares about our needs. But really, ultimately, that's part of prayer is petitioning God. But that's not the totality of prayer. The totality of prayer that it's deeply personal and that prayer is about getting him. And so that's why God speaks to us in a gentle whisper. And in 1 Kings 19, we see that. And so um, today I want to give you guys four points just about prayer. And hopefully I can give you some paradigms, but also practices, because that's what we're talking about, um, talking about again today, prayer. So um, Socrates, and I um, don't believe he was a Jesus follower. If you track all the history and the timelines of all that, I don't think it was uh, even possible. Um, Actually, maybe it was. I I should go back and figure out when Socrates was born. Actually, this is what's really cool. Check this out. I'm sitting at my computer. Um, When did (laughs) <laughs> when did Socrates live? Yeah. Boom. Look at that. Um, yeah, he couldn't have been a Jesus follower because he was gone long before Jesus got here. So how about that? But Socrates said this. He said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And I believe that same idea um, for us, guys, we get living so fast and so quick and um, our lives just get out of control. They get so loud and so busy. Um, I remember years ago, um, and I've told this story before, and I actually won't tell the whole story right now, but I remember years ago, uh, Erica, Pastor Erica and I went to uh, Cedar Point, and I wrote a ride called the Mantis, which actually isn't there anymore. It's, it's actually still there. Um, I think it's called the Rougarou now, but they changed the cart and some of the things. But in the Mantis, um, I remember riding on the Mantis, and I, I'll just uh, say the story this way for today. I had one of the most painful, um, maybe... <laughs> I mean, in a joking way a little bit, but it was a radically painful experience on a roller coaster. Um, I'll just say like this, it, um, the Mantis had bike seats. And as a man, if you sit on a bike seat and there's G-force that presses you down onto the bike seat, I'll just leave it there. You guys can um, fill in the gap on the rest of the story. Um, it was a really painful roller coaster ride. But what was fascinating to me is that I had this really painful experience on this roller coaster. I actually ended up trying to 
um, push up on my feet to get pressure off the bike seat and both of my calves cramped up. And then we ended up doing a loop-de-loop -loop and going upside down and I actually ended up blacking out on the ride. Um, and the entire time I was having all of this crazy pain and all of this terrible experience, Erica was next to me and she had no idea. And the reason she had no idea is because there was such a, just so much happening on this roller coaster, right? I mean, obviously you're I mean, rocking through uh, the stratosphere at like incredible speeds. And, and so um, the idea was that I could be having this crazy experience and the person right next to me wouldn't even know. And the reason they don't know is because there's so much happening. There's so much loud. There's so much fast happening. And I think sometimes we can actually, even as Christians, be close to God, but there's so much happening and there's so much stuff going on that like... Uh, there's just this like divide, this barrier between these two entities. And just like on the roller coaster, Erica had no idea what I was actually experiencing, what was actually going on. In a similar way, God can be speaking. God can be, I, I don't remember yelling on the mantis, but I probably did a little bit. And I don't think Erica even heard me. God could literally be speaking out loud to us. He could maybe even literally be yelling to us. And because of the speed and the noise and the velocity of our life, we just can't even hear him. And so, um, that brings me to kind of the first point for today um, is number one, and I'll put this on the screen for us, is, is that God is a speaking God. Um, our God is a speaking God, you guys. And so the first thing that we need to understand about prayer is that God is a speaking God. Pastor Mark Batterson said this. Um, he said, all of our problems in life are actually hearing problems. He said, as I survey my life, I realized that the genesis of every blessing, every breakthrough is a whisper, the breath of God. Now, here's the idea, you guys, is that um, we actually think we have a lot of problems in life. But as Christians, as believers, as those who actually walk with God, have the opportunity to walk with God, um, all of our living problems are all hearing problems because we serve a God who still speaks. So if, if we're having a problem it means that we're having a listening problem, that we actually just need to understand that God is actually still speaking and that we need to be listening. And so the first thing we have to understand, right, is that God is a speaking God. Um, the Bible starts and ends with God speaking. It starts in the beginning. In the beginning, um, God spoke the world into existence. So if you go read the book of Genesis, God speaks to start the world. And then if you go into the book of Revelation, it it's the spirit of God speaking to the seven churches. And so the Bible begins and ends with God speaking. Um, God wrote a thousand plus page bestseller called the Bible. Um, I've got several of them right here behind the camera that you're looking at here, um, looking from here. He likes to communicate. God is a speaking God. He, he created with a spoken word in the book of John. He's called the logos or the logos, which is the word of life. Um, the presupposition is that God is a speaking God. And as Christians, we have to believe this because um, it would be cruel, honestly, uh, to claim that we could have a relationship with God if he doesn't still speak. Um, it would be very, very weird. And yes, I understand there's a case to be made to say, well, God already spoke everything that he needs to speak through the Bible. Um, God did speak through the Bible, but we believe if you read the Bible and you read the New Testament, um, in the Old Testament even, God's spirit would come down and speak to people in moments and then would descend back. But in the New Testament, we actually see that the Holy Spirit came and descended on Jesus and actually stayed with him. For the first time ever um, in the early parts of the Gospels, we see the Holy Spirit descending on a human and staying, not coming and speaking and departing, but staying. And then we see Jesus live a perfect, sinless life. He, You guys know the story. He dies on the cross. He resurrects again. Um, but it says when he dies on the cross that the temple, uh, uh, the curtain temple uh, was torn. And in the Holy of Holies, where the Holy Spirit was dwelling, the Holy Spirit rushes out of the temple. And actually, um, the Bible says in the New Testament that he now dwells in us, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So here's the idea. The Spirit of God, is a, he's a speaking God. The Spirit of God actually left the temple and actually dwells in us. So God is still speaking. In John 10, 27, it says, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. And again, all through the scripture, whether it's Jesus talking about speaking or whether it's the Holy Spirit dwelling in us speaking, we understand that God is a speaking God. He's again, he's speaking in the very last book of the Bible to the, to the churches. So God is a speaking God. And if we're going to understand prayer, we, we have to first understand that God is a speaking God. The second point this morning, you guys, is that we have to learn to hear. So if God is still a speaking God, and we're talking about prayer today. We're talking about the goal of prayer is getting close to God. And we're talking about all of our living problems are actually hearing problems. We understand, number one, that God is still a speaking God. God is a speaking God. Number two, we understand that we must learn to hear. So if God's speaking, we need to learn 
to hear. And um, hearing from him is not an audible type of hearing, although I do know people that say they've heard the audible voice of God. I personally have not. But um, but God speaks to me on the inside. God speaks to my heart all the time. What I think is fascinating is that when I hear my wife speak, I hear her through my ears, but then it goes down and I process what she said in my mind and in my heart. God just skips the faculty of our physical ears and goes right to our mind and our heart. That's how he does it. Um, and, um, and so I think that's really, really fascinating. And, um, in the, uh, some people might say, you know, Pastor Scott, it seems weird that we would need to learn to hear God, but we see again, patterns all through the Bible of people learning to discern what God's saying. If you, if you look at the stories of Jesus and the disciples all through the new Testament, they're constantly not understanding what Jesus is actually saying to them. So they're having to learn to discern, to hear what Jesus is actually meaning. Um, if we go back to the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel 3, there's a story of Eli and Samuel. Eli is um, a seasoned priest, and Samuel is kind of a, a young um, priest. And in, um, in 1 Samuel 3, this is actually verse 7, it says, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Now, this is fascinating because Samuel's actually in the temple of God where God speaks. And Eli is his mentor. Eli has been hearing from God for a really long time. But it said that Samuel didn't yet know God, didn't yet understand his voice. I'll say it like this. He had not yet learned to hear. Okay. He didn't know yet. So he was, the voice of God was all around him. Mentors that heard from God were all around him, but he hadn't yet learned to discern God's voice. Um, I put in my notes. In other words, he had not yet learned to discern God's voice um, and I think this is where some of us find ourselves. And so we can be in church environments like this. We can be around people who are hearing God's voice. And we just yet for ourselves haven't learned to hear God's voice. Now, here's what's fascinating is if you read the story here in 1 Samuel 3, three times God actually shows up and audibly speaks to Samuel. Um, actually, literally does audibly speak to him. Samuel hears the Lord in his ears. But Samuel doesn't know it's God. He actually thinks it's Eli, his mentor. So he continues to go to Eli and say, did you call for me? And Eli says, I didn't call for you. And the third time Eli realizes what's happening and says to Samuel, it's the Lord speaking to you. Next time uh, he speaks to you, say, uh, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. Here's what I think is fascinating is that Samuel, as a young man who's not yet learned to hear God's voice, even though he's hearing God's voice and he's surrounded in an environment where God's voice is, um, he, he needs to learn from someone even like Eli, who's a mentor, how to hear God's voice, even though he's hearing it. Isn't that fascinating? He's hearing God's voice, but he doesn't know how to hear God's voice. I just think that's really, really amazing. Um, and so uh, he needs an older mentor, Eli, to help him understand how to discern God's voice. And so what I want you really to see in this story um, is, and yes, I understand we're in the New Testament now and the Holy Spirit reveals to us and I, I get all that. But what I want you to see and what I want you to hear is that um, there is a process of us learning to hear God's voice, even when he's already speaking or already hearing him. We need to learn to discern when he's speaking and how he's speaking. And so um, learning to hear requires repetitive experiences. God continues to come back to him and Samuel continues to try to discern it. Um, it requires help from others. He had a mentor in his life, Eli, who he could go to and say, hey, what's happening? Can you help me kind of discern what's happening here? And then learning to hear requires listening from a surrendered and an expectant posture. You know, Eli said to Samuel, hey, next time the voice comes, say, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. There's this idea of posturing our hearts in a certain way to be able to learn to hear God's voice. And then learning to hear is powerful. And Samuel eventually would be the man that would actually anoint Saul and then actually call the kingdom out of Saul's hand and then anoint David and then actually deliver the kingdom to David. And so, um, you know, Samuel became a powerful tool in God's hand because he learned to discern God's voice. Um, if you want a New Testament example of this, I actually was processing on this actually earlier today. Hold on just a second. I have to drink from my hubby cup. My wife gave me this cup. It's one of my very, very favorites. Very thankful for it. Um, I was processing this today, uh, you guys, out of the New Testament, actually, in John 5. And Jesus actually um, gives us this fascinating concept for living. And then I'm, I'm going to give you this. And we'll move to point three. But um, Jesus said this. He said, I never, I don't do anything that I don't see my father doing. And I don't say anything I don't hear my father saying. And uh, we may be familiar with the scripture, but it's really fascinating to me that Jesus lived his life in such a way, even though he was 
he was God, but he was 100% man, 100% God, that he chose to limit his divinity in such a way that he operated as a man. And that in his operating as a human, um, he, he lived a life in such a way that he only did what he saw God doing and he only said what he heard God saying. That basically he lived his life in such a way that he was actually dependent on hearing the voice of God and learning to hear God's voice so that he could actually be effective. So that he could actually live a God, uh, you know, a, I'll say a Christian kind of life. Um, in, in John 5, verse 19, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. Isn't that fascinating that Jesus said, look, think about life like this. He said, I can't do anything. He said, I only do what I see the father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. And then verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all that he does. Yes, he will show him even greater things than these so that you'll be amazed. Here's the idea is that Jesus was saying, look, here's how you want to live the Christian life. You live the Christian life learning to hear what God is saying and to see what God's doing. And then that's what you do. Because that's actually what's effective. That's actually what's life-giving. That's actually what brings uh, the Christian life into fruition. And so I just want to share with us just that idea of, guys, we we should be learning to hear God's voice and then living out of what we hear and what we see. And I'm just fascinated by the idea that that's exactly how Jesus lived his life. And I'm like, man, that's how I want to live my life. And I, I hope that's a prayer for you too, that that's how you want to live your life. That's how we want to live our lives as Christians. God, what are you doing? God, what are you up to today? God, where are you going? God, where are you speaking? God, what's going to work? God, I don't know how to do this thing in front of me. God, what do you want me to do? God, I don't know where my responsibilities start and stop with the people around me or the demands around me. God, would you show me what you want me to do? And God, you love us. And so God, you show us. Did you catch that? The father loves the son, verse 20, and shows him all he does. Do you get that? There's this idea of learning, hearing, discerning. So we need to keep um, learning to hear. So um, if we're going to pray and understand prayer, we have to understand prayer is about getting closer with God. We have to understand God is still speaking God. We have to understand that we must learn to hear. And then point three, you guys, is that nobody can do this for us. And yes, there are people that can help us. And this gets into this idea, right, of self-propelled discipleship is that nobody else can do this for us. I mean, even right now, I can do my very best to prepare a teaching and to share this. And we're in a series called Self-Propelled Discipleship. But really, at the end of the day, I can't do this for you. And, and you can't do this for me. Now, we can help each other and we can support each other. But nobody can do this for us, you guys. We're the only ones who get to make the decision of whether we are individually people of prayer, whether you're a person of prayer, whether you are a disciple of Jesus or not, whether you are one who leans in to hear the whispers of the Father or not, you're the only one who can make that decision. And I've shared this story many times because it was so impactful for me, but I read a book called The Soul Keeper many, many years ago. And it tells the story of a village and there's a river running down into the village. And at the base of the village, the trees and stuff would fall and clog up the river. And there was a man who the town employed to actually keep the river clear. And as long as he would keep the river clear, the, the river water would flow down the mountain into the river and the children would play in the, in the water and they would bathe and and um, the, the community had water to drink and they could cook and, and all and life was good and the children played and the swans swam. And, and then there was this idea that the, the town decided they no longer had the funds to employ the river keeper. And so they actually took him off staff and, um, and over time, uh, trees fell down and garbage and, and clutter actually clogged the river and the water stopped and they no longer could cook and they couldn't brush their teeth and you know I can make up whatever you want but the, the children couldn't play and the swans couldn't swim and life was hard and so the town reconvened and they decided that they would find the resources to be able to reemploy the river keeper who could actually clear the brush so that the river could flow again and they did they employed him again they found the resources they made the decision to clear the river the water flowed and again as uh, John Ortberg so beautifully does in the story that you know the children played the water flowed and the children played and the swans swam and life was beautiful and and so the idea was is that um, I wrote in my notes here, we are the we are the only ones who can employ the river keeper. And in the story, the river is God's word, prayer, being with God. And um, we are the river keeper. We are the town that gets to decide if we employ the river keeper. We are the ones who must make the decision to find the resources. 
the time, the energy, the passion, the focus to, to keep that river flowing. And no one can do this for us. We are the only ones who can make the decision of, hey, it's a Tuesday morning. This is what my prayer life looks like. Nobody else's eyes are on me. Nobody else is looking. Nobody else knows. It's me and the Lord. And I'm making a decision to keep that river flowing. I am the river keeper. I am the townspeople who get to make the decision of whether I can find the resources. And so um, we are the ones, we get to know him positionally in salvation, but we get to know him more as we per- pursue him in his direction and in his voice. And, you know, uh, I've used this analogy before, but it's like being married. I, I knew my wife, you know, 20, over 20 years ago, um, uh, actually it'd be 21 this summer that we've been married. I knew her 22 years ago before we were married. I knew my wife, but now I know her so much better because I've spent years learning her voice and learning what she's passionate about and what she loves and what she doesn't love. And, and with God, it's the same thing. We know him positionally in salvation. We know him, but then we get to know him more and more and more, but that requires us to, to commit resources, to commit time, to commit energy, to commit passion. Uh, in, in focus and same right with me and my wife, uh, date nights and, and getting to know her heart and all of those kind of things. And, and you guys, you get this, but nobody can do this for us. You guys, we're the only ones that can do this. And I remember years ago, um, I was in a season where I was a little bit burned out and I had a, um, I had an opportunity where I just, uh, I'll say, I say it was an opportunity. I just made a decision. I was like, I just got to get out of Dodge for a couple of days. And I remember, um, I had an assistant at that time, uh, his name, you got a lot of you guys know him, Colin, he was playing kind of an assistant role for me at the time. And, and I just, uh, I think I texted him and I just said, Hey man, I just need to get out of Dodge for a couple of days. Can you literally just find me a place? I don't care if it's a closet I don't in somebody's house. I don't care if it's like, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I don't care if it's a room in a church. I don't care what it is or where it is. Can you just find me a place to get away for a couple of days? And um, and I remember I had an opportunity uh, to get away. And I remember one of my mentors said to me in preparation for that trip, he said, he said, when the world gets quiet and, and I, when the world gets quiet, when you make the world quiet, right? Um, God gets louder. And then uh, my mentor said this, he's, God is always speaking but it's multiplication by subtraction. And just the idea that when we quiet the world, God gets louder, not because he actually gets louder, but because he's always speaking. And when you turn something else down, the thing that's always there is just gets a little bit louder. And so, um, but you guys, nobody can do that for us. We're the only ones that can do it. And I'll just say this, that our responsibility is not for God to speak. That's his responsibility. Our responsibility is to put ourselves in a position to hear. And, uh, and so, and nobody can do that for us. And then um, number four, um, you guys, number four um, is that we forcefully create space to hear. And and I, I use the word forcefully on purpose because forcefully, if you look it up in the dictionary, forcefully is a strong and assertive manner, uh, something done in a strong and assertive manner, vigorously. And I like that because, um, because as I said, it's not ever convenient, really. I'm sure maybe there's convenient times when we can pray, but we have to make the decision to create space to hear. And if we're going to understand prayer, we have to understand not only um, conceptually what prayer is and how you would do it and whatever, we have to experientially create space to hear from God. And we've got to do that force. We have to take it by force. Um, Gordon Hempton said, quiet is a think tank of the soul. But quiet is something that we've got to forcefully take. And again, it's not our responsibility for God to speak to us. It's just our responsibility to put ourselves in position to hear and to listen. I want to give you guys some practicals on how to do that. Um, obviously, um, you know, uh, you can do that by just disciplining yourself to uh, create a pattern of prayer in your own life. And, and, um, you know, maybe that's putting it in your calendar. Maybe that's just taking the time to actually process through God. How do you want me? And this is a great opportunity to to start your prayer life, um, to start praying in a new way. God, God, what do you want me to do? to be more consistent with my prayer life and listen to what he says and then, and then do your best to be faithful to that. But um, a couple things that we wanted to do to create some stuff for you guys is um, as always um, element phone app here. If you um, open up the phone app, if you don't have the app, go download it. Uh, we've created, um, we have a prayer book that's on here. It's, it's right here. I don't know if you guys can see that. Yeah, you can kind of see it. That's kind of cool. Um, you can see that in that tile there, that is the element church prayer book. It's called pray first. You'll see the little tab that says pray first. If you click that and open that up, that'll actually be the Element Church prayer book. And that actually is just a book of prayer. I help you um, with prayer. It actually has prayers right out of scripture. So we have that for you. Um, 
And then uh, we have a Wednesday morning prayer group that meets. And so if you'd like to be part of that, you um, have to request uh, permission because we have a Zoom uh, link that goes out. But you can go to the groups page. And again, you can access that on our website or you can actually get that through the Connect tab on the phone app. And uh, we'll get you the information. If you go and sign up for that, we'll get you the information to join Wednesday morning prayer. But, um, but you guys, as we close out this morning, I just wanted to remind us of this, that the point of prayer is actually getting to know him. The point of prayer is actually getting to know him. And in John 16, 13, it says this, it says, when he, the spirit of truth comes, it's the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit that lives in us, he comes and he speaks to us and he doesn't speak on his own accord. He speaks what the father says. Um, what he hears the Father speaking, he speaks to us, you guys, and that is prayer. Prayer is leaning in for those whispers from the Holy Spirit. And again, why does God whisper to us? God whispers to us, whether we're in a place of desperation or whether we're in a place of just a daily routine, God whispers so that we'll get close and we'll get near because he loves us and he wants to meet with us. And I, I will close with this idea. And again, another thing I've been pondering on lately, I've been reading a book and it, um, it talked about the blessing of God. And it talked about how the whole Bible is actually laced with blessing. Um, the Bible starts out and God creates everything. And he, se he steps back and he says, and it's good. And God creates and then he blesses. It says that he creates Adam and Eve and then he blesses them. Um, in Abraham, when he creates the first covenant with humanity, it says, uh, I, will, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to all nations. And then like even Jesus speaks about the Beatitudes, his most famous sermon. And he says, blessed are those who, and over and over and over again, blessed. And then in the book of Revelation, it ends with uh, a proclamation of blessing. The 12 tribes in the Old Testament are each blessed by their father with unique blessings. All through the Bible, you guys, there's this idea of God blessing his people. And I would just say this is that God wants to bless you and he wants to bless me. Not because we deserve it, but because he's so good. It's just part of his character and his nature is to, is to bless, to be good, to, to be loving. And, and in John 16, 13, what we just read, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. I, I could say it like this. He will guide you into all blessing. He will guide you into all of God's truth, all of God's love, all of God's goodness, all of God's blessing. He won't speak on his own, but he'll speak what he hears from the father. And then he will tell you what is yet to come. He will share with you what, what God is doing and what God is yet to do. So I don't want to end this time on prayer with kind of this again. I, and I don't feel like our time to, today has been this but this dry like discipline of prayer, but this exciting world of opportunity that opens up this blessing of God where we can lean in and listen for God's voice about wow, what he's doing and what he wants to do and how he wants to bless and how he wants to love and how he wants to give and how he wants to build into us and the promises that are yet to come and reminders of the faithfulness that have already come. And so I want to pray over us that we would just have a new passion to be a people of prayer. And I know for many of us, we've been praying for, for decades. Um, we've been walking with God and we've been getting to know him, but there's always more. Just like, right, my relationship with my wife, I got to know her, but there's always more. And there's, there's more, there's more, there's more. So let me pray over us. Father, I pray this morning, God, that you would just teach us, God, to be a hearing people. God, I pray that you would continue to stir up in us just a passion to pray, God, to lean close and to hear your whispers, to hear your voice, God, to discern what you're saying. God, we know that the point of prayer, that the, the end game of prayer is intimacy with you. So I just pray fresh intimacy over us as a church family, God, that we would just long to be close to you in fresh ways. And God, I pray that as we, God, we, we, can't, uh, we can't be responsible for you speaking, but God, we can take the opportunity and the, the responsibility and the maturity, God, to create space for you to hear. And so I pray that there would be a new passion in us to create that space. And God, I pray that we would remember that you're still a speaking God. And God, we remember that we must learn to hear. And God, that no one can do that for us. And God, um, God, that nobody that can do that for us and that we must forcefully create space to hear your voice. And so God, I pray that as we do all of those things, we would be prompted and encouraged, God, that we could hear your voice, that we could hear your whispers. And God, that you would speak fresh blessing over us, fresh anointing over us, fresh life over us, fresh love over us. And God, that you would speak over those whom you love. And I thank you for that, God. And God, we do just like Samuel did. God, we posture our hearts in a, in a position of receptivity and openness. And we say, come and speak, Father. Come and speak, Jesus. Come and speak, Holy Spirit, for your servants 
are listening. And we thank you for that this morning in Jesus' name. And just staying here in a moment, just in a posture of prayer. If you've never started a relationship with Jesus before and you want to do that, the Bible says he wants to speak to you and he wants to love you. He, he already loves you, but he wants you to feel his love and to sense his love. And he wants to have a relationship with you. And if you've never started that relationship with him before, you can do that right now. And I want to pray this with you and you can pray this with me. Just say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God and that you came and lived a sinless life and that you paid for my sin, all the things that I've ever done wrong so that I could come back into right relationship with you. Today, I receive your sacrifice for me and I declare that you are the Lord and Savior of my life. God, thank you that you're a speaking God and that you want to speak to me. I want to hear from you. God, come and speak. And God, I'll live with you all the rest of my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer with us today, would you let us know? Would you text the keyword element to 97,000 right on your phone? You'll get a link back. Click that link. It's a form. If you'd fill it out and there's a box on there that says, um, I started a relationship. I made a commitment. I think it says I made a commitment today to Jesus. But you started a relationship with Jesus today. Would you click that box and let us know? And um, we'll get you an email that gets you started out on the right foot. Uh, with Jesus and with us here at Element Church. We, uh, we want to invite you to be part of this community. Uh, be part of a good Bible-believing church. We like this one and we want to invite you to be part of it. So, hey, Element family, I love you so much. We're going to move into a time of worship. And uh, I just want to invite us, even in this time of worship, can we make this a time of prayer? Can we make this a time where we really listen for the voice of God? And uh, as we worship him and as we listen for his voice in a posture of surrender, I believe he's going to meet with us today. All right, you guys, let's do it. Let's go into a time of worship. Love you guys.